So, this morning I wanted to uh, speak to you very specifically uh, about this story. But before I get there, I, I must tell you, uh, I, I overheard a conversation the other day. A young woman had just volunteered at a youth retreat where the youth stay at people's homes in, in the town uh, that they all live. It was an in-town retreat, right? So they, they're staying at somebody's house, and this woman has volunteered her time and is sleeping away from her comfort zone, away from her house, and she's sleeping in some stranger's house. Not really strangers, they went to the same church, but they didn't know each other very well. And she's getting ready for bed, and, and as she's getting for, ready for bed, she's moving her things about, and, and she sets something down and hears a noise. And, and at first, the noise gives her a little bit of pause. And then she just tells herself, no, no, that must, that must have been my, my uh, clothes that I just dropped. So let me, let me see if I can do that sound again. So, I, so she picks up her clothes, and she drops them again, just as she had done before. And she was satisfied that the sound was close enough to what she had heard that she laid down. And it wasn't but moments after she laid uh, her head on the pillow that she began to hear. It was the sure noise of a mouse scampering across the floor. You've heard this noise before, surely. Uh, well, I hope no, nobody ever has, but we all know uh, rats and mice are a thing in this world. And so we, we are familiar, we can imagine those little feet scurrying across the floor, and immediately her eyes shot open. She began to go, I didn't make that sound. She knew what it was, and so she's laying there in bed wide awake. And as the night went on, she, she, she heard the noise again. And she heard the noise again, and then, she saw that glow of their eyes. It wasn't just one, but two. And they had made their way onto a table in the room, and they were about eye level with where her head was resting. And at that point, she occurred to her, it occurred to her that she had lost all hope of getting any sleep that night. Are you with me? She was not going to be sleeping and run the risk of a rat crawling on her while she was sleeping. Right? You can imagine this, this feeling of hopelessness. She has just spent her entire day volunteering her time with youth. And we know that sometimes young people have a lot more energy than we do. And so she was tired and she wanted rest because the next day they were going to go again and do more. And she needed her rest. But she realized in that moment there was no hope. I mean, what's she going to do? Go to the homeowners and say, uh, by the way, you have uh, rats. It's not something you want to tell somebody who's at the first night you're ever staying at their house. It's, it's not a kind thing to do. Uh, and if you've ever dealt with rats, you know that it won't be solved that night. The problem won't be solved that quickly. It takes a little bit. And so the thing is, she was hopeless of her sleep. And see, I, I think that that's a funny way of saying that we've all felt hopeless before. Right? We, we know that feeling of just defeat. Like, I wanted something so bad, she wanted to sleep so bad, and then she heard the noise. We want something so bad, and then we don't get it. And when we don't get it, we just feel deflated. And so then we try again, sometimes. And we get defeated again. We get defeated again. And again, and again, and sometimes life beats us down so much 
that it's not just one night of sleep that we've lost. It's not just, it's not just one thing that we've lost on. We begin to feel like we can't win. That no matter what I do, no matter hard, how hard I try, something is going to happen. Something is going to take place in my life that's just going to knock the legs out from underneath it. And we get skeptical. Have you ever met somebody who, anytime you bring up an idea, they, they meet that idea with, well, that's not going to work. Well, we tried that once. Well... Ten years ago, I did something, and it didn't work, so I'm not going to try again. You ever, you ever come across this? Have you ever felt this way? I think that we can all identify with being at that point, at some point or another in our lives. And that's where this woman was. This woman who is so much a nobody in Scripture that she's not even given a name. Have you ever noticed that? Who's, who is this woman? She's a woman from Samaria. That's it. She's not given a name. She has a whole conversation with Jesus. She's referenced as the woman at the well. Everybody knows the woman at the well. But she doesn't have a name. This woman had been defeated so many times in life. She saw love. She sought attention, and she sought approval. She sought for somebody to, to see who she was, and to know her, and to love her. But as we learn from Jesus, this woman had been told a number of times, you're not good enough. She had five husbands. Five husbands. That's bad luck right there. That's, some re that's a really bad string of luck for a woman with men. Five husbands. I know a lot of people these days that would give up after two or three. Right? You know somebody that's been divorced and they're like, I'm never getting married again. I've had, I've had that once. I don't need it. I, I, it it's, that's just too much for me. I, I don't want to go through the headache or the hassle of trying to, to find somebody to, to love me. It didn't work. I tried that. It didn't work. Why bother trying again? I did that, and, and it worked well, but then my heart got broken because something happened that was outside of my control, and I don't want that to happen again. I don't think I can take it. I don't think that my part of my life can handle being broken again. And, and so we give up. We stop trying. We become skeptical of everything around us. And see, this woman here who is greeted by Jesus at the well, she comes to the well by herself around noon. And as we know, from history and from customs of regions that still seek water from a well, that a woman going by herself to a well is an outcast. They usually go together. It's like to the bathroom, maybe. <laughs> There's a little, hey, you're awake, that's good. Uh, I, I sometimes like to inject a little bit of humor. I spend a lot of my time uh, with young people at the church that I currently serve, and so I it's all right if y'all banter back and forth with me a little bit. If you, if you react a little bit, that's all right. So this woman comes to this well, and she's an outcast. She's been dismissed by society. She's been dismissed by five men. Because the woman at the time did not have the power or authority to dismiss the man. She had been told she's not good enough. She had been broken down. She had been defeated. She didn't get what she wanted. And she had been so broken and jaded by this experience that she removed herself from any friends. She removed herself from all social interaction of walking to the well with other women, drawing water, talking, and then walking back. And so she goes to this well by herself and she sees a man. 
And she is so skeptical of this interaction. But when Jesus says, hey, can you give me something to drink? Then her reaction is, why are you talking to me? Why are you talking to me? See, not only did she know that she had been rejected by men, that she had not been loved, that she had been found not good enough, but that she also knew that the Jews from Jerusalem did not like the Samaritans. You see, when King David reigned, the entire area was together. The promised land was all together. Right? That land promised to Abraham passed down through Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob had the twelve sons, one of whom Joseph had the well that they were at. Right? We know the history. These all were tribes of Israel. They were all people of God. They were all Jewish from the beginning. But something happened after King David, the kingdom got split, and people thought that God, God's self, was living in the temple in Jerusalem. And so the further away from Jerusalem you got, the further away from God you got. You're not with God because you're up there in the north, and God is down here in the temple, right? So that they got a little big head about them, right? They won a few times. And so, now Jesus is passing through, and she says, what are you doing talking to me? We've been separated. The, the Jewish people think that God forgot about us. They think that we're wrong about God. So why are you talking to me? I've, I've, I've lost so many times in life, and you're, and you're one of those winners over there. And, and why? Why would you bother with me? And that's exactly why Jesus meets this woman at the well. She is in a place of hopelessness and defeat. A place that many of us find ourselves from time to time in life. Brokenness. Depression. Seeking love and approval and trusting that we will get none of it. Jesus says to her, I know all about you. I know that you have had five husbands and that you're with somebody now who's somebody else's husband. And, and, and it's not good. But I'm still offering you living water. God, God's self in the form of Jesus, speaks into this woman's life and says, You are good enough for me to talk to. You are good enough for me to be in your life. You are good enough for me to do amazing things for you. Without a bucket, he gave her water. Without a bucket, Jesus gave her water. And it filled her so much that she left her jar and ran back to tell He's told me everything I've ever done. One way to look at this passage, one way to preach about this passage is, what has God done for you? And think about it from a story of what is our witness? What is our story? What is it that God has changed or done in our lives? And I can stand up here and I can tell you stories about miracles, stories about things that I've seen, things that I've heard, things that I've received, things that would amaze you. And, and that would be a beautiful testimony of what God has done for me. But the thing here, the thing in this story, the thing that God is continuing to do, and what God wants to do for each and every one of you, is take your hopelessness and turn it around. Because it's not just about what God has done for you, or what God has done for you lately. It's about what God does, what God continues to do, and what God will do tomorrow. And the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. And so if you are beaten down and broken, if you feel like you have been rejected by love, if you feel like you have been rejected by everything that you've tried, if you feel like you can't win for losing, 
Jesus says, you're good enough for me. And he takes our hopelessness and he turns it into hope. And what do I mean by that, that he turns it into hope? He didn't give her anything, right? He, he, didn't, he didn't have a bucket to draw water. He didn't, what, she left her bucket of water. Like, what? She had a conversation with somebody and then she goes about like her life has been changed. What happened here? And that's what, that's what sometimes confuses people about the faith. Is that when God speaks that word of approval into your heart, it's not necessarily something that is outward or visible. It's not something that can be measured or say, here, look, feel, and touch this. It's not like Thomas who doubted and say, here, touch the holes in my hands and my side. Sometimes the word that God speaks into our hearts of approval that says that God loves you and there's nothing you can do to change that. When God speaks that word into your life, sometimes all you have is your word. And you're in such a habit of skepticism that you still go and you say, you say, God, this man, he told me everything I've ever done. He's not the Messiah, is he? Like, she's still doubting a little bit, but she's telling people what God has done. She's still doubting a little bit, but she's still telling what God has done for her. What was real to her. It changed her life in that moment. And she becomes the first evangelist in the entire New Testament. This woman who is so nothing that she doesn't even have a name. The disciples, they didn't bother to ask, hey, uh, who are you? So, you know, when they wrote this down, they're like, hey, what was that lady's name? Uh, I forgot. I never asked her name. She's still, by many standards and many measures, unimportant to people that think they're important. But to God, she made a difference. And Jesus tells the disciples, hold on, wait a minute. Hold on, wait a minute. They're like, hey, uh, we brought you food, let's eat so we can get on about our business. And he says, wait. And they end up staying there an extra two days. So an entire city, Sychar, uh, there's this thing in that, in that region at that time in history, they like to name their cities as play on words, right? The, the, name, the city called Sychar means sin and debauchery. This place of brokenness, this place of nothingness, this place where God had forgotten about, Jesus comes and says, you're good enough for me, and uses this woman who's, who's seen as nothing. And he accomplishes great things with it. He converts a whole city. He says, don't you say, four months still till the harvest? Now, uh, I noticed driving out here, um, there's a lot of fields, right? Not a lot of crops, but a lot of fields. Some cattle, right? But I, I'm guessing that we understand some of these agricultural references that he makes here at the end of this passage. That if you want to reap a harvest, sometimes you've got to work even while the plants are doing their work and growing. Even sometimes when you can't see a result happening, even when you're not bringing grain into your silo, you've still got work to do. So the that harvest can happen, right? Y'all with me? A little bit? All right. We need stronger coffee. <laughs> so the thing is that Jesus takes this woman from a place of hopelessness where she's pulled herself out of society and told herself that she's not good enough. And what he does is she goes back into the city. And in her wonder, in her newness of faith, 
she goes to other people. And she begins to interact with them. And they respond to her, at first out of caution. And then at the end, the last verse, it says, we believe. Not just because of what you said, but because we also have seen and heard. Jesus took this woman who was an outcast, who was unloved, and didn't just say to her, I love you. I know you, and I love you, and I accept you. But he gave her back the society that had left her and that she had left. That's the beauty of the gospel, that it's not just about a spiritual thing, it's a physical thing as well. She was restored to the community in this. Because she began to love herself. She began to not feel defeated. She began to have hope. She began to understand that she was loved not just because of the people around her, or what she could do for them, but because God is the one that created her and loves her. And she began in inward approval, right? Yes, she did. That's my daughter. This woman loved herself, possibly for the first time in her entire life. That is the power of the gospel, my friends. That is why we do what we do. And that is the nature of God. From beginning to end. From the time that Jacob made this well, to the time when Jesus met this woman at this well, to today, when we look at our own lives, when we look into spaces where we feel defeated, we look into spaces where we feel unloved, and unlovable. And we understand and experience the grace of God that is figuring out how to love ourselves so that we can love our neighbors. You were made in the image of God. If you want to love God and you don't love yourself, you've got it backwards. You can't do it. God's image is in you. The image of God is in you. If you don't love yourself, you can't love God. If you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not saying be selfish and start doing, oh, he ain't me, you know, like Terrell Owens, like, I love me some of me. Get your popcorn ready. It's a little too pop culture. All right, that's all right. Uh, it, actually, that's like 10 years ago now, wasn't it? Well, what was that? that was 2007. Get your point. Man, I'm getting old. Um, nonetheless, from beginning to end, God takes the unloved, the broken and the defeated, from Adam and Eve who hid from God's presence. And God continually pursues and says, no, I love you. I love you. Love. Love the you that I made. And when you do that, you begin to approach the world differently. And you begin to see transformation happen. You begin to see community restored and lives change. More than just your own. More than just a pot of water. And that's what it means to have a well of living water inside yourself. And that's the gift of this story in the gospel message. What is it that you've been defeated? Because God wants to say, have hope. Have some hope. And then do something with it. This is the word of God for people.